Dr. Wally Naurta was not only a brilliant neuroanatomist and scientist of the 20th century, but also a selfless and brave soul. He revolutionized research tools in neuroscience, making it possible to better understand one of the biggest mysteries of humankind, our brain. Exigent but kind, intuitive but rigorous, and most of all humble, he lived a life worth remembering. Hello Curious Cats, and welcome to the fifth episode of the podcast. Thank you for listening, and I would be very grateful if you could leave some feedback on the Instagram page or just drop me an email. Thank you again. So, let's get into it. Born on the 8th of June, 1916, in a family of Dutch mission- missionaries in Malacca, Sumatra, Wale Nauta spent only his childhood in his place of birth. In the late 30s, his whole family returned in the Netherlands, in Leiden. Despite becoming a renowned neuroscientist and anatomist, he apparently wasn't a very dedicated student. He really got into studying only when he was accepted into medical school. You know, it's like people find their interests and pursue them when things are not shoved down their throats. Thought. After finishing his preclinical studies in 1937, he went on to do his rotations when the German army occupied the Netherlands during World War II. Unfortunately, two years later he had to finish his qualifications at the University of Utrecht, another one, as the former was closed by the Germans for being a hotspot for a rebellion. While working in the pharmacological department at Utrecht University, he met, fell in love, and eventually married Eli Platt, another Dutch Indonesian. Apparently, sometimes the smell of pharmacy can work as an aphrodisiac. Then he went on to practice both as a physician and a researcher, working at his doctoral thesis. The years of war were extremely hard on everybody, including their young family. If feeding your family was a difficult task, imagine conducting research on rats and trying to fulfill all the upkeeping necessary. It's been reported that at some point they ran out of food for the rats and they were put in the position to feed them with milk sourced from uh, none other but Mrs. Nauta while she was nursing their first child. I know that desperate times call for desperate measures but if I would whoop up my TT, I'll improvise, adapt and overcome. I hope I won't be copyrighted for that. Moving on through the years of war, the Nauta family had the courage to hide a Jewish girl from the occupants. They had also a lot of luck because the German administrator of the district where they lived played along and didn't turn them in. But for this act of bravery, their name, meaning Wale and Eli, are written on the wall of the just in Jerusalem. Despite the horrific acts of the German army, they never judged individuals based on their nationalities. The Nauta family protected the German administrator until he was allowed to return to Germany after the war, to show their gratitude in this sense. It shows a high-value character to be able to show such kindness and self-sacrifice despite all the atrocities that happened around them during those years. On October 26, 2008, Yad Vashem recognized Wale Nauta and Eli Nauta Plat as righteous among the nations in Jerusalem. But the war was finally over and the family could return to Leiden, where he got a student assistant position. 
Here he started to develop his obsession for the study of the hypothalamus, a region of the forebrain that is a crossroad of many behavioral and environmental responses, such as body temperature, thirst, hunger, sleep, and also emotional activity. This happened after he came into contact with the work of Walter Hess, who was studying the sleep-waking cycle, as well as Philip Bard's research of sham rage, which apparently is defined by its simultaneous uncontrollable, uncontrollable anger and fear. I had no idea, but there you go, having a new word to describe being very angry but very fearful at the same time. Uh, now that I recognize that there are, there was a, I'd be actually smarter than you for putting in less effort and getting more out of it. Actually, probably that is not what it means, but I found it to be a funny scenario. And all similarities to real life is purely coincidental. Just as a side note. So, now that I recognized that there was a technological gap that prevented scientists from fully understanding the functions of the hypothalamus, and that was the fact that the neuron projections for the hypothalamus were not myelinated. That just means that it lacked the protective sheet of cells usually found around the neuro neuronal projections. At that time, if you inflicted an injury in an animal's brain, you could later trace the effects of that injury by following the degraded neurons or axons, and that was reflected through the destruction of this protective myelin sheet. As you can see, that made the study of the hypothalamus extremely different, as it was impossible to tell the real effects of an injury in that area, because those projections of the hypothalamus do not contain myelin. So, no injury, no effect. You could not trace the problem. So, Nota embarked on an adventure to uncover the secrets that this crucial part of the forebrain still held by its dear neurons and got a research position at the anatomy department at the University of Zurich. He initially tried to get hired by Walter Hess, but he saw no behavioral evidence of Nauta's proposed research plan and rejected him. As a consequence, he got a job under Professor Gian Thundery. You know how they say, one professor's rejections is another one's treasure, or something like that, I think. Nota became really popular amongst his students and benefited from immense support from his supervisor. I wish all of the supervisor would comprehend that what a great influence they could have on their students. Nauta's new staining method, named after himself, used silver nitrate and was able to mark all the fibers in the brain, including the ones that were degenerating. A later iteration of the protocol was able to suppress the staining in the healthy neurons, showcasing only the ones that were degenerating, which was a huge, huge discovery. The significant breakthrough of the Nauta Gygax method enabled scientists to perform major anatomical discoveries of the central nervous system. The development of this technique seems to have been largely done through trial and error and also a bit of luck, how it is always in, in science. For instance, they noticed a surprisingly good result one day 
and traced it back to the usage of an old bottle of formalin that had an unusually high concentration of formic acid. Being more of a biology expert, he partnered up with Paul Gygax and Lloyd Ryan in order to understand the chemical mechanism behind this effect. The first was a PhD student in organic chemistry at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology and the latter was a former US Air Force major and passionate amateur photographer. I've been told that networking is a must, but never thought making friends in the military though. Maybe I should re reconsider, who knows. Reading through a short biography of Nauta, done by Edward G. Jones, it seems that the only one that actually understood the chemical processes behind the technique was Gygax. What makes this even more amusing is that the author of the biography recalls the fact that he surprised one of his own students bowing three times in the direction of Boston, where Nauta will move later in his career, before performing the staining. He comments that, I quote, whether this was respect, disrespect or merely su su superstition was never quite clear, unquote. But I think we all need someone to watch over us and our Guardian angels probably don't have PhDs in chemistry, so somebody has to have your back. The news about this revolutionary technique spread like wildfire, and soon Nauta was invited by David Mackenzie Riach to do a live demonstration. Mackenzie later offered him a position at the research division in neuropsychiatry in Washington DC, later moving to Massachusetts at MIT, where uh, all cool kids go, of course. Here he contributed to remarkable and valuable research where other scientists distinguished themselves as well. If you're interested, I'm going to put a list of them in the description and you can read more about them. Now a little, uh, a little break of the program. I was thinking to surprise my listeners, the ones that get at least half through the episodes, and give them a, a little bit of research homework. Maybe learn some additional cool things. And uh, yeah, they are related, of course, but uh, they're a, a bit different. So, for this episode, I want you to find out who was awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine for a very controversial and drastic neurosurgical procedure that involves an incision in the prefrontal cortex. So, you should probably find out the name of the person, the procedure, plus if his prize was revoked or not. The answer will probably make you angry. Moving on. I hope you have fun with it. Two things that I really liked about Nauta was that he had a distaste of publishing in a rush just because, you know, publish or perish is a very prevalent mindset in the scientific community even today. Instead, he perfected his results and papers until they reached the level of accuracy and relevance that he considered appropriate. I do appreciate someone that sets the bar high and is unapologetic about it. The second was that he gave full recognition for his students' results, a lot of the times leaving his name out of publications, which is unheard of for me. I have I've never met someone that would do that. I think I would rather get a kidney from my supervisor than not having their name on my paper. But 
bright side is that at least I can sell a kidney not my publication so you know you gain some you lose some you can't have it all as a result his early work has been regarded as the reference for the research that followed and is a fundamental part of textbooks nowadays what he studied the most was the fornix, the amygdala, the basal ganglia, the substantia nigra, and the spinothalamic tract. No, the names are not inspired from Star Wars. Uh, I will put a picture and some more explanation on this vital brain components on the Instagram page, as well as some recommendations for a really cool book on everything brain and behavior if anybody's interested. Needless to say, he received a lot of awards and recognition, thankfully while he was alive, which is a big plus. His approach was to look at the bigger picture, first by paying attention to the ways its smaller parts came together. He was regarded as inspiring pedagogue passionate about sharing the scientific knowledge and leading by example. Although his experience during World War II showed how ugly humanity can be, he didn't let that corrupt him, but instead cherished kindness and humility. He enabled us to understand at an anatomical level why we feel and behave the way we do, which give us more power of our own lives. His story was indeed one of success, but most of all of humanity and perseverance. He died on the 24th of March, 1994. And for this episode, I will finish as always with an excerpt from his memoir that I feel encompasses the essence of this episode. I quote, Wale Nauta represented the type of neuroscientist that is no longer with us, a classical neuroanatomist with an enormous depth of knowledge who could work on any part of the brain, but one who also, in touch with modern developments in neuroscience, enabled to cast his neuroanatomical studies in a modern context. With a strong base in medicine, as so few basic scientists have today, he never lost sight either of the necessity of casting one's research in the context of diseased nervous system. He was per- perhaps the epitome of non-reductionism, not the prevailing motive in today's neuroscience. Yet, his influence was broad, not only on account of his modernizing almost single-handedly the whole field of experimental neuroanatomy, but also because of the influence that he had over so many students and fellow scientists as a collaborator or teacher, or as an author of some of the most fundamental papers in neuroscience. So, thank you for joining me on this great episode. It was really interesting for me. I will put some resources as always in the description and also a lecture that I discovered from MIT uh, done by him if you want to see the man live please do check it out and another thing that I wanted to announce is that I will be starting a mini series on Another side of lives to remember, but this time they are not human. They will be on animals, animals that scientists use to study and that also need some recognition for what they enabled us to discover now and how they improved our lives in so many ways. If you are interested in that, I will try to get one out hopefully every couple of weeks. And as always, I hope you'll have a nice day, afternoon, evening, night, middle of the night, whenever you are listening to me, if you're falling asleep or not. I hope you fall asleep because you're going to bed, not because it was boring, but you know, I'm not judging. 
and hopefully see you or hear you next time.